homeschooling for about 15, since 2004, I've been homeschooling. My daughter was four years old at the time. And tonight we're going to be trying to cover a lot of ground. So we have the Facebook group, we have a MeWe group. It's not as active as Facebook, that's for sure. And just about everything we talk about tonight is going to be available in a really long email with a lot of um, attachments. If you need to get a hold of me to ask questions that you forgot to answer in the chat tonight, you can admin at homeschoolonlongisland.com and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Or join the Facebook group and you can probably get an answer quicker. Okay, first I wanted to talk about the Middle Country Public Library. We've set up an educational resource center there and many libraries across the, the island are going to be doing the same thing. So you may want to find out what's available at your library. They have the website, they have, they have programs, uh, they have uh, parent collection, toy collection, uh, microscopes and all kinds of DVDs and the library of things, which is like science. Um, this is the curriculum that they've purchased for homeschoolers to be able to borrow. You can take your library card from wherever you are on Long Island and take it to this library and they'll give you a homeschool library card <clears throat> and you'll be able to borrow from the collection. Uh, there's some really good programs. They have uh, Life of Fred math, teaching textbooks math, the mystery of history, um, uh, the story of the world, all the spectrum books. They, they have so many science kits too and it's really great. So get a hold of them and get your library card so that you can borrow things or ask your library if they can do that too. We set up at a few libraries on Long Island. This is what we're going to cover tonight. We're going to try to cover it tonight. I had a bit of coffee, so I'm going to probably talk fast <laughs> to get through it. <laughs> so we have the paperwork, the regulations, high school co-ops, pods, and all the other big code words that we're having these days. Uh, socializing, uh, curriculum choices, uh, testing, transitioning to homeschooling, uh, juggling with multiple children, special ed services, and we'll take the questions and answers at the end. So if uh, you have any questions, just ask them in the chat and we'll cover those at the end if I haven't already answered it within this. Your first job, number one, is to learn the regulations. Um, the New York State Department of Education has given us regulations to follow for home education. It's uh, 100.10, the regulations that apply to us. The other regulations don't apply to us. There's a really great question and answer section on the uh, Department of Education's website as well. And it's really helpful and it covers just about every question that you have. If you're in New York City or the boroughs around the city, you have slightly different requirements, like you'd have to give, uh, you'd have to register and give birth certificate and all that. And this is where you would sign up. There's a huge homeschool community in the city as well. And they have a central office that you send your paperwork to if you're in the city and the surrounding areas. But if you're on Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk County, uh, you'll be sending it to your local school district. Paperwork. Okay, there's only a few pieces of paper that you need to homeschool. Uh, compulsory age is when the child turns six on or before December 1st of that school year until the end of the year the child turns 16. In some schools, they've raised it, like Longwood, they've raised it to 17 if the child is not working. There's a few districts on Long Island that have done that. Um, Pre-K and K are not mandatory and you don't have any paperwork required before first grade, before the child is compulsory age six, unless you have a special needs child <clears throat> and you need an IEP or special services. Uh, the first letter you're gonna need is to let the school know that you're going to be 
homeschooling, that you're in the district and your intent is to homeschool. So this is the LOI or letter of intent to homeschool. This sample form that I have here is the only information you need to give the school, the superintendent of this school district, your parents' names, your address, and you would list all your children's names on this um, form and the parents would sign it and date it. If you have a uh, separation or a divorce in there and you have sole custody, you would put your name on it. But if you have joint custody, both parents need to be on board with this. Um, so then the next piece of paper, once you send in the letter of intent, the school is going to send back to you a packet of information, just sample paperwork and the regulations. Um, of the rules to follow for homeschooling. And they will also include a sample IHIP. It's the individual home instruction plan. It's what you may do during the year, but it can change. You can say, hey, I'm going to be using uh, this great curriculum. Everybody says it's so great. And you, you start to use it and you get a month into it or a couple of weeks into it. You just hate it. You can always change it because the learning the subject content is still going to be basically the same. So you can swap out those books, that curriculum with an online or a DVD, or you can mix it up to some books and some DVD. Uh, it's changeable during the year and you won't have to submit a new, uh, new paperwork. You just reflect that in your quarterly reports. Um, new York State says that we need to include certain subjects in certain years and to be in compliance with it, with the regulations. Uh, you can list either syllabi, your curriculum materials, your textbooks, or your plan of instruction. So you can give um, apology of text uh, chemistry. You can give that as what you're going to be using for the year. Or you can say, we're going to be counting by twos, four, six, eight, ten, up to a hundred, and we're going to be covering fractions, and that would be your plan of instruction. Instead of giving a textbook name, you give your plan of instruction what you'll be doing, and you'll have a lot more freedom to use whatever books you need to use to make it more suitable for your child. You basically have to find their learning style. These are the required subjects in each grade. Uh, K through 12, you have to do these at least once uh, in all of those school years. Uh, patriotism and citizenship. Uh, grades one through six, you have to cover all of these subjects. Seventh and eighth, you have to make sure you cover this much of each of these subjects. And at least once before ninth grade, U.S. and New York history and the constitutions. In ninth to twelfth, those are the subjects you need to cover. And you have four credits, which just means you have to do it for four years straight. Two credits, uh, you have to do it for at least two years in high school. But if your child is going on to college, you're going to want to do all of these subjects every year in high school so that you get that much closer to your degree. And homeschool children have been known to graduate early, being able to take, instead of two credits of math, you take four, take four years of it, you get extra high school credit. And you can also earn college credit at the same time. We'll get more into that after. This is what an IHIP looks like, the Individual Home Instruction Plan. This is the only information that's, well, it's kind of blank right now, but the spaces is the only information you're going to need to give. The name of the child, your address, the age, the grade level. You never need to give the school a birth date, social security number to homeschool. Uh, you need to give the dates for a submittal of the quarterly reports. You choose those dates. Sometimes schools want to tell you those dates, but if those dates don't work for you, you are supposed to be able to choose your own. And never do trimesterly reports because the um, New York State says you do quarterly reports. So if you do a trimesterly, you're already showing that you don't know the regulations. So, oops, wrong way. This is what the IHIP would look like filled out. This is just the form that I use. Some people use a different structure to their IHIP. Um, we've used um, November 15th, January 30th as the basic 
dates. They're well spaced. They only have to be well spaced out throughout the year. And if the 30th falls on your anniversary or the 15th is like your birthday and you're going away or something, just choose another day that works for you. You don't have to use these dates and you don't have to use the school's dates. Use what works for you, well spaced dates. Now for the subjects, I have all the subjects in the, the left hand column and in the, the big column is going to be where you post your um, textbooks, so your curriculum materials, your um, syllabi, or your plan of instruction. And on here I have it counting by ones, twos, fives. That's just subject content and it doesn't matter what books you're using. The school has nothing to say about what books or what curriculum you use. They can't, uh, they try to say I am approving your homeschooling, but they are just checking to make sure it's in compliance with the New York State Department of Education regulations, that you've covered math, language arts, history, geography, science, that you're covering all the correct subjects in the correct years. Uh, they can't say they, do, they don't approve of your curriculum choices. Uh, that's not their place. That's New York State Department of Education's place. Uh, <clears throat> This is a, a higher grade, but it's still the same thing. This, this particular family used a Celius online school. And so their IHIP looks a little bit different, but it's still just the basic information. They've also given a Celius as the name of their curriculum that they're using. So you can mix it up as much as you want and as much as you're comfortable with. Most people will take the scope and sequence from their curriculum company and copy all that great information and just stick it into their uh, IHIP. But you don't need to do that. Just take out all the fluff words like, oh, your child's going to be learning and they're going to be so filled with knowledge. Just take out the fluff words and leave the content, the, the meat of it. This is a quarterly report. Um, this is the only information you need to give on a quarterly report as well. All the subjects are there. The description of what you've covered is in the center column. What you've covered for that particular quarter based on your IHIP. Now, if you changed what you're using on your IHIP, the, the content is still most likely the same. So you're still going to be able to fill this out like this. Uh, sunlight, you know, this one we chose to use just the curriculum uh, in the middle column. And on the right column is your narrative or your grade in each subject. Now at the end of the year, you have to give a narrative and this would be your narrative. Um, in the lower grades, it's excellent, doing well, shows growth or loves to play. Um, it's just a written descriptive narrative for a grade. In the upper grades, you may want to change over to uh, uh, letter grades because you're going to be doing a transcript when you get to the high school years. This is another sample quarterly report. The quarterly can be written like this as a, um, like a paragraph letter type format. You can do that. It's a little bit harder to read and you're going to have to uh, do a little bit more writing in here about, you have to give a, a narrative or grade in the subject. So you would need to add that to this as well. So the, this, I saw this graphic timeline on, I think it was homeschool legal defense, and I changed it a little bit, but I really like the timeline. Uh, the first thing you're going to do as a parent, number one, is if you have a special needs child, you're going to buy June 1st each year. You're going to request services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, whatever kind of special needs services, and an IEP for the uh, for the child by June 1st of each year. But all of these dates are different if you are a first time homeschooler, like most people watching this right now are just thinking of homeschooling. All of this you have up until the day school starts to get your paperwork in. Technically it's two weeks after school starts, but it, I tell people just try to get it there when school has started. That's when they're in their, their zone, their mode. Uh, the next for a parent would be the letter of intent. You have to get that in by July 1st every year, except this year, they've changed it to August 1st. But even that, as a first time homeschooler, you've got up until the day school starts. 
And with COVID, it's probably better to let them know ahead of time that you are going to be homeschooling. So the sooner you get this in, the better, um, because they can give that spot to somebody else. Um, number three would be the school district is supposed to respond to receiving that letter of intent. And their response is usually what we lovingly call the packet. It's a big envelope full of paperwork, and sometimes it's an email with a lot of attachments now. Uh, but you don't need to use any of that paperwork that you get from the school. It's just supposed to be sent to you as sample paperwork in case you don't have any already. And if you are part of my group, you definitely have paperwork. I make sure of that. And there's different styles of paperwork, but I have all the sample paperwork in my files section. And I also have the regulations and I try to make sure people stick to the regulations, but I can't police everybody, right? So you have to make sure that number one rule is you learn the regulations. That's your first job. And the regulations aren't that long. Um, they do get intricate when, when you get up in the grades, but first time homeschoolers just learn how to do the paperwork and learn how to cover the subjects. Uh, number four, by August 15th, you're supposed to have your IHIP in or four weeks after you receive the packet from the school. So you send in your letter of intent, they send you the packet, and then you make sure you get your IHIP in. You are also very welcome to send in your letter of intent and your IHIP together at the very same time. I've always sent my letter of intent, IHIP, my last quarterly report for that school year, my letter of intent and I hit for the following school year and my standardized tests. I send everything all at once and I give a cover letter saying what's included in this uh, envelope. And I get one signature and one tracking and that covers it. I don't have to pay for four of them. So whichever is later. So by August 15th or four weeks after you get your packet. So if you don't get your packet till um, August, August 10th, you still have four weeks from that day. Shut that off. Um, so what the school is supposed to do next is once they receive your IHIP, they're going to check it to make sure you're in compliance, to make sure that you've covered the proper subjects and that you have the, the subjects completely covered with uh, what kind of work you're going to be doing. They have to do that by August 31st or 10 days after the receipt of the IHIP. So by, if you send the IHIP in, they have to send it to you by the end of August or within 10 days, whichever is later. So a lot of schools that I know, one friend has been homeschooling 11 years. She has never heard once from her school district. The school district is wrong. They should be um, uh, responding to her when she sends in her paperwork. But I told her to make sure that she gets a signature receipt and tracking for all the paperwork that she sent. And she's covered with homeschool legal defense as well. So they're supposed to tell you whether you're in compliance or not. So they should write back to you and say, yes, we've received your IHIP and you are in compliance. Happy homeschooling. And that should be it. Uh, if you're not in compliance, say you forget science, somebody had me check their paperwork uh, yesterday and they forgot science. So if you've forgotten something, have us look it over. We'll, we'll check it before you go and send it to the school. Um, but make sure you have all the subjects covered. If you're not in compliance, they'll send back saying, oh, it's deficient, you forgot science. So you adjust it and send it back. You have 15 days to get it back to them. And the school the school districts should respond within another 15 days. And then it's happy homeschooling <laughs> until your first quarterly report. And that's going to be due sometime in November around the 15th or the 18th or the 12th, whatever date you happen to put on your quarterly report. Um, they just have to be even logical periods of time. And then there's going to be an annual assessment. Alert for Brave Browser. Very friendly. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's going to be an annual assessment. And these are not the tests that people opt out of in school and sit out in the hallway or go to 
um, the gym room and do something while other kids are taking the test. These are annual assessments and there are no tests due or required up until fourth grade. So you can homeschool K through third, K through fourth actually, and never give a test. And in, uh, I know somebody's going to cover this later. Um, it's, Kayla's going to be covering this later. So there are certain years that you have to send in an assessment test and Kayla will cover that later. And next, high school. High school, uh, homeschoolers do graduate. We get, uh, we, <laughs> we're so involved in our kids' education. Uh, they get, they graduate, they get, sometimes they graduate early, like my daughter. She graduated at the end of 10th grade and started full-time college classes while homeschooling. And she ended up getting an associate's degree by the time she graduated. Kids get a diploma. It's going to be more of a, what they call lovingly the mom diploma. It looks just like a diploma. It's a piece of art that you hang on the wall. That's all it is. I don't know anybody that ever brought their diploma on an interview at a college to see if they're going to uh, be able to get in. Uh, you don't need a diploma to be able to get into college. There are tests, the college entrance exam that you would be taking. We do uh, transcripts. There's a great transcript service. It's, all of this is in the email as well. Uh, fasttranscripts.com does some really beautiful transcripts. They go to college. My, my closest friend, her son, um, he's in Stony Brook University and he homeschooled all the way through. And we do, we, <laughs> once again, we, the kids do become doctors, lawyers, artists, teachers, whatever they want. They can follow what they, they want to do. This, for homeschoolers, what you need, instead of the diploma signed by the school district, your diploma is going to be signed by you. But you're going to, in ninth grade, you're going to ask your superintendent if they'll supply this. Uh, letter of substantial equivalency because you're going to be submitting quarterly reports for every year during high school. They're going to get um, 16 of those reports. They're going to get a letter of intent. They're going to get IHIP from you every, every year. They're going to get uh, assessment tests at the end of every year. I have a checklist to be able to send with this to be able to start the process of getting this letter saying that um, this is the one that my school district gave me and at the end of it, it says I therefore certify that this child has completed the equivalent of a four year high school course in compliance with the New York State Department of Education section 100.10. That's, that's homeschooling. And they signed it and they put it on beautiful paper and she's got it in her portfolio. But this is what we need. This is what you would take to a college interview is this letter and your transcripts. Um, if the school says no, I'm not going to give you that letter. New York State says that they, they can give this letter and have made accommodations for us to get this letter. But if your school wants to be difficult and don't really, doesn't really care about uh, the child's education, you know, that's a, that's a strong statement, I'm sorry. Um, they would say no. If they do say no, uh, legally, you don't have to report to the school anymore after the child turns 16. Uh, but I know the schools, for the most part, do care about the kids and they do want you to continue sending in these reports so they can see how well the kids are doing. So most of them are going to say yes to this letter. Uh, I, I haven't heard any so far myself that turned it down. Uh, next. This is a transcript. This is what your transcript would look like. Uh, I got this on fasttranscripts.com through Homeschool Legal Defense. And it, I added a few things to it just to see how it, it uh, did what it does. It, it adds up your grade point average and all that. And it's got pull down menus where you're going to put in all the classes that you took. My daughter took all of these classes at the end here in, um, on study study.com and sophia.org. It's all in the email as well. All these links to these companies. And um, she got three college credits 
and one high school credit while she was taking these in 11th and 12th grade, some of these classes. So if she did an, a history class or English, uh, British literature class, she did. She did world, world history, it was a college class. Um, so she got a credit for that college class for high school, but she also at the same exact time earned three full college credits towards a degree while she took this history class and while she took the, uh, the English literature class. She took those and got college and high school credits at the same time. This is what the diploma looked like. You would fill it out. It's a piece of artwork that you're going to frame, put up on the wall. There's companies where you can get this diploma printed out in, in that nice squishy, um, whatever these things are called, that has the diploma in it. Um, yep. And we also do graduation ceremonies, cap and gown. This was the New York State Leah group who um, do a cap and gown ceremony pretty much every year. You have to be part of the group, that particular group, for two years, I believe, to be able to graduate with the rest of the students there. My daughter was the only one to give a little presentation that night, and she also did her secret handshake with Daddy, you know, at the end of it. And people loved it, and a couple people cried. Oh, that was so beautiful. So. Um, that the letter of substantial equivalent I told you about earlier that I showed you is one way. Another way to get into colleges like uh, Stony Brook University is one of the colleges that's a little bit harder to get into. Uh, you have to fulfill all of these semester hours before you can get into Stony Brook. So my friend's son uh, graduated homeschool and went to Suffolk Community College and got two years worth of credits and then transferred over to Stony Brook University, transferred all his credits, and he's going to be in the medical field. Okay, we're going to touch on this tonight. This is a really intricate kind of uh, subject, there's, but there's a lot of people talking about it. The groups are all buzzing with this right now. Tutoring, pods, co-ops, and all the new hot words that are out there right now because of that New York Times article. Um, in the New York State regulations, it's got that great question and answer section. This is one of the questions. May parents engage a tutor to provide home instruction? The answer is absolutely yes. Parents can engage a tutor for services of a tutor to provide instruction for all or a portion. You can do 100% of your homeschooling with a tutor in your home or an au pair or a, uh, a nanny or your sister is going to be home because she just had surgery. She can uh, teach your children while you're at work. There's a lot of different home life situations that are happening uh, with this, this new COVID thing. People have to work. They have nobody to take care of the kids. A family member is welcome to do it. Um, there are teens within the homeschool group that would love to help tutor that can help take care of the kids too. They do babysitting um, and they're pretty good with their studies so they would be able to help teach the younger children. Um, one other question was may groups of parents provide home instruction collectively by engaging the services of a tutor to provide group instruction. So now parents providing home instruction to their children may arrange to have their children instructed in a group situation for particular subjects, but not for the majority of the home instruction. And when you hear the word majority, you think of, oh, the majority of people, 51%. So, if you want to boil it down to a percentage, most people go, okay, 51% I have to do, and somebody else can do 50% or 49%. Um, where groups of parents organize, this is the continuation of that sentence in the last slide, uh, organized to provide instruction by a tutor for a majority of the instructional program. They are operating a non-public school and are no longer providing home instruction. So you cannot send in homeschool paperwork if you're in a group situation like this for a majority of the instruction. 
So make sure it's the minority of the instruction to be able to do any kind of group co-ops. And there's a lot of great co-ops, uh, which is the next slide. Uh, co-ops, traditional homeschool co-ops, they meet once, twice a week. They can teach core subjects or enrichment courses. They go on field trips. Uh, they're taught by parents pri primarily. Parents take turns teaching each of the classes. I'm in a co-op that meets um, every week, but uh, once a month or once every couple of months, I'll teach a class or my daughter will teach a class. And there may or may not be a cost. I never charge when I, when I give the classes. Um, I want to be able to bless people. Uh, you can hire a tutor for your co-op, but it can't be for the majority of the instruction. You can hire a tutor to do a class, uh, like my friend up in uh, Nassau County does. She's got a co-op going, and for one particular subject, she hires a tutor to take care of it because there's nobody in the group really that uh, feels qualified to instruct that uh, a class in that. And the person they hire does a really great job. So they, they like to keep them for that. Um, you can rent a space or meet in homes. Uh, there's a lot of free spaces out there, like parks with gazebos covering. So you don't have to worry about it if it rains. And there's park benches. Um, it, and traditional co-ops are not a drop off. The parents are required to stick around and help. Clean up, stack chairs, put out tables. Uh, walk a kid to the bathroom, whatever it takes, keep the younger ones occupied, whatever you can do in that co-op situation. If you can't do the teaching, then do the cleaning. Uh, that's what a co-op is, traditional co-op. Um, some have a lot of families. Uh, okay, this is a double. <laughs> Pods. Pods is the new code word the new hot word uh, from the uh, New York Times article. Now, social pods, learning pods, enrichment pods, pandemic pods, it's all basically the same thing. Uh, some pods, with the people I've talked to recently, they're starting pods because they want people that are going to observe protocols for COVID strictly. They want a maximum of five families in the group it's going to be the same five families every week, no more than five, because she doesn't want 10 people uh, in the room. Uh, you're going to sign an agreement that you will only socialize with these families. That's what a pod is. It's closed circuit. If you go outside your pod and decide that you're going to the mall or you're going to another group's activity, you have to agree to quarantine yourself for two weeks. The same thing as with traditional, uh, parents do the teaching in uh, pods and you may hire tutors for the class. But like the New York Times article said, is a group of parents hiring a teacher to teach all of their children every day, that's an illegal pod. That's not in New York State regulations as homeschooling. They can be a, a non-public school, but they have to file non-public school paperwork. And they also have to watch out for the daycare laws, depending on how old the children in those pods are. So that's why I have a problem with talking about pods and co-ops on my group. I, I filter them out very carefully because I don't want to be associated with any illegal pods. <laughs> and talking about legal things, I'm going to touch on two, two legal entities here in New York. New York Home Education Network and Homeschool Legal Defense. Uh, NIHEN is New York based and Homeschool Legal Defense is America, you know, all over the country. So NIHEN used to be on Yahoo Groups. It's now switched over to IO Groups. It's secular. There's no religious affiliations in their background at all. There's lawyers in the group that will answer questions, but not give legal advice. Um, the membership is free. You can just join. This is in the email as well. You can join NIHEN and uh, just post a question that you want answered. Oh, my school district said this, and is this correct? Just, they'll answer you. 
and you may get immediate answers if someone's online uh, but it's not, not usually too long to get an answer on that one. Uh, they'll direct you to the proper resources if you do need legal help. They can help guide you a little bit to who to go to. And it's all completely online. Uh, Homeschool Legal Defense, they are a Christian-based company with Christian values in their background. Um, they protect the rights to homeschool anyone anyone at all whose right to homeschool has been violated. So if you are, um, uh, no matter what your religion is, your orientation, your family choices, your any of your background choices, it doesn't matter to them. They will represent you if your right to homeschool has been violated. Um, there is a membership fee, I think it's $98 a year with my group you get 18 percent off and you get a membership card that will give you discounts at staples and office max and any place that offers teachers discounts uh, they have a lawyer on call 24 7 so if you get a visit at your door from a truant officer or cps or something like that uh, you can pick up the phone call them Tell them what's going on and hand the phone out the door. You don't need to let those people in, in the house. Um, a lot of times it's unsubstantiated. It's just somebody being nosy. Anyway, um, they will answer member questions, which says that you need to be a member for them to answer the legal questions. They do have a lot of extra people on the phones right now from last year when the religious exemption was taken away, they added a lot of people to their phones to be able to um, answer all the questions from people. Do, what do I need to do? So they helped out that way. And this year with COVID, they're, they're helping people as well. Um, they have a perks program that you can get discounts on driver's education and certain uh, curriculum. They have an online academy as well where you can take high school classes and they do have uh, Patrick Henry College as well. I think they're affiliated with them in, in a way and you get a discount on those. But you can homeschool from kindergarten all the way through and never need homeschool legal defense. I've been a lifetime member. I started when my daughter was in kindergarten and I've only uh, actually used them for help twice. Uh, as a support group, I do ask them questions and they're happy to help, but I don't get legal advice. Um, I've only gotten the legal advice twice in the uh, 15, almost 16 years that I've been a member. So you can homeschool without a problem for a long time without ever needing them. But when you do need them, they're there for you. And next we're going to have Dara come in and talk okay. about special needs homeschooling. Am I back? Okay. Yeah. Hello. Oh, tra transitioning. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about transitioning from public school, homeschooling with multiple children or younger siblings and special needs and IEPs. So my name's Dara. I have three kids. I have one that I've homeschooled since kindergarten and he is now 15. So I've homeschooled him throughout. He's never been to public school. And I also have two kids that have been in public school who are transitioning right now to be homeschoolers. So we could talk about that. Um, some of the things that I did with my kids who are coming out of public school is to um, involve them in the decision making any way you can. Um, like with my daughter, I asked her if she would like an online program or does she want textbooks or a mix? To me, it didn't really matter. She decided she wanted the textbooks and everything. So that's what we went with. Um, we talked about it a lot. We went through a lot of discussions, why we're going to be homeschooling, what are the perks of homeschooling, what are you going to miss about school, um, listening to their concerns and their worries if they have any. Um, you don't always have to have all the answers to their questions, but you can always listen to them and let them talk to you and let you know how they're feeling and just letting them know that you understand and you love them and just things like that can go a really long way because we don't always have all the answers to all their questions. Making it fun. This is the best part. We just did this. We've done decorating around the house. My daughter helped 
laminate a calendar for her younger brother. Um, we walked around, we figured out where we're going to hang things, um, signs and stuff like that. She got to pick what space she wanted. Where do you want to do the work? Do you want to do it at this table? Which seat do you want to sit in? So lots of choices and things like that. Um, picking out uh, the supplies too is fun. And if you're excited, they'll be excited. It'll rub off on them. So even if you're nervous or you're not 100% certain, try to keep that you know, more to yourself and just show them the excitement that you have and let them know that it's gonna be a great school year. And this is the part, um, the fun side of homeschooling and all the perks to homeschooling and my kids love sleeping in, especially my high school son. His peers in public school are up at six in the morning. He doesn't get up until about five to nine. He has to be downstairs at nine o'clock to start his schoolwork. So he gets up a few minutes before he has to get downstairs, brushes his teeth, changes, he's good to go. Um, we don't have to stand outside in the rain or the cold to wait for buses or anything like that. Um, we can have pajama days as much as we want. Lots of um, homeschoolers love to homeschool in their pajamas. They can do that. Um, they'll have a lot of extra time to explore whatever interests they have special interests or topics that they want to delve into. Um, homeschooling is going to be a lot faster. It's going to take a lot less time to go through the material. So you'll have a lot more time to let them um, look into something that they're more interested in than the schoolwork that you're giving them. Some people do de-schooling or unschooling for the first few weeks just to let them transition where you would do no schoolwork. Just let them relax, let them read, let them play give them a few weeks to just, you know, get out of the school mode and then um, start up with your schoolwork. Um, again, letting them explore their natural interests or hobbies or, you know, just letting them tap back into that natural curiosity that most children have about learning until it's, you know, kind of taken away from them at some point. So um, you do not rep need to replicate a school schedule at home. You don't have to work from nine to three. You can do evenings, you could do weekends, you could do holidays that school normally have. Um, it's gonna take a lot less time, being that it's only one kid that you're teaching or however many kids you have, it's just them doing the lesson. So you're gonna um, notice that you have a lot more time on your hands. And you don't have to worry that if they go back to school, they won't forget things like how to sit at a desk or how to raise their hand or walking in a line. You don't have to replicate all those things at home. So. Um, and there's going to be a lot more time for natural learning, hands-on learning. The kids love that stuff. Uh, we always try to find uh, moments in our day where we could go over things that we learned or that we've already learned in school. I like to talk about how, you know, with little kids, it's easy. You could point out colors and shapes and have them counting for you. If you go to the supermarket, get me three apples or how much money is this going to cost or, you know, for little kids, it's easy, but I also do it with my high school son. We have a lot of political conversations. He's aware of what's going on in the world. We talk about, you know, things like wildfires. He can understand like the beginnings, how that happens. And um, I like to explain, um, we did exponential growth in algebra. You guys are probably getting so sick of hearing about this, but <laughs> Teresa and Kayla, but um, you know, we didn't, we had a real life uh, thing in the news about that with the virus that's going on. So while he was doing this in algebra, we got to see it. Wow, like look, here's an example of it. We were watching it happen basically. So that was really cool for, um, you know, for the high school age. Um, there are just endless opportunities to do natural learning. They're all over the place and you'll find that you'll integrate that in your day a lot too with the kids. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so before I do the special needs and IEP, I just want to talk quickly about um, homeschooling with multiple kids or younger kids, which I did when my son was, he's the oldest kid. So when he was kindergartner, he had younger siblings in the house that made a lot of noise and wanted a lot of attention. And some of the things that I did with his younger siblings was to have what they considered their work. It could be a blank piece of paper with crayons. My daughter would sit there, she was a little two-year-old, scribbling on paper and showing it to me and she'd put stickers on things that made her happy. So that's something you could do. Have special like arts and crafts for them to get into. Play-doh maybe or slime or something that they can occupy themselves with. 
if you have, um, if your child needs less noise in the background, what we used to do is my son wore noise canceling headphones, which back in the day were those big, you know, construction worker headphones that we got from Lowe's or Home Depot. Now they have really cool ones that look like earbuds that you could just pop in the kids' ears. So if the younger kids in the background are distracting, you can give your kid who's doing the work the noise canceling headphones. That works really well. Um, we also would break up the work. So if I needed him to sit at the table and do something, it's hard for the little kids to occupy themselves for too long. We'd do a little bit of work. We'd take a break, go do something with the little kids and then come back and do work. So you could do that also. Um, you can also use the dreaded screen time. Now's the time to break out that iPad or the iPhone or whatever you normally don't want them to stare at. Sit on the couch, be quiet. I need to work with your brother right now. We gotta do what we gotta do. TV works for that too. Um, and if you're teaching multiple kids, like this year I'm gonna be teaching multiple kids, uh, some things that you could do is um, separate the workspace. So like even when my kids were in school, I would have my homeschool son working at a table by himself and then my two younger kids would sit at the table and do homework. And I could walk from this table to that table and help them out. You know, sometimes you might have to separate them or you can have them all work at the same spot if that works for you. So there's just some ideas um, on how you can make things work if you have younger siblings or multiple kids that you are homeschooling. Okay, now on to the special needs and the IEP for homeschooling, which um, I also experienced with my son. He also had an IEP when we started homeschooling and he had some special needs, which is why I chose to homeschool him. So if you um, have a, a child who does receive services or they have any special needs, you can homeschool them. You can do um, any accommodations that your, your child needs, you could do at home. My son used to need a lot of movement. He could not sit in a chair for very long. It was okay. If he needed to get up, he could get up and walk around. Um, we could shorten assignments. If he was doing a lot of writing and his arm was getting tired, we could just stop writing. And he could tell me the rest of the problem or tell me the answer. So these are some accommodations that we can make at home and you don't need approval from the school district or from a teacher or anybody. You can just make whatever accommodations that are gonna work for your child. Um, your kids can maybe need fidget things. Like in school, I know with my kids, they weren't allowed to bring fidget cubes or fidget spinners to school because it disrupted the whole class. But at home, they can use those things if they need them. It's not gonna disrupt anybody. Um, they can get up, they can walk around, they could take eating breaks or drinking breaks, or that's another one that you could tie into the perks is they can have food at the table with them. If they're working and they want to munch, they could do that. They could work and they want to drink, they could do that. So my son needed lots of food and water breaks and bathroom breaks, and that was perfectly fine. Um, another thing that worked for us is um, I was able to be his one-on-one -on -one aide while working on any issues that we had. So when we went to homeschool programs, when he was very little, there were sometimes I had to sit next to him. There was sometimes I had to quietly go over and redirect him or remind him or something. And it worked out really well. The homeschool programs weren't six hours long. They might've been at his young age at that point, an hour, 45 minutes. So I was able to you know, work with him in those settings. It was manageable and he uh, came a long way with that. Doesn't have any issues with that stuff anymore. Now I could leave him at the science, the Stony Brook labs. I mean, he, some of them were like four or five hours long, drop them off have a great time. So it all works out. Um, okay. So if you do get related services through the school, which we did, you might still have to bring the child to the school. Sometimes they um, require that the child will go to whatever their home school would be, whatever building they go to, to receive the services. Nowadays, I don't know how that's working out because even the kids in the district are having a hard time. They might require it over Zoom. In some instances, they do have um, services provided at the house. But don't get your heart set on that because it's not always the case. Um, so if your child qualifies because they have a diagnosis and they have testing scores that qualify them for services, you are entitled for services and they will be able to get them as a homeschooler. The only one that you won't be able to get will be a special education teacher. 
So if your child's in a self-contained class, they'll have special education teacher on the IEP. Um, you will not be able to get that, that will come off. But any other services that they receive will be on that IEP. Um, you will need to be registered with the district. So if you have a child that's not already registered, like if they're you know, kindergarten age or younger, you'll need to register them. And if they're older, they will still, they will stay registered in the district when they get services. And then um, you also need to do whatever testing schedules they have, which is different than the testing that Kayla will talk about. This is testing in order to keep them receiving their services. So sometimes that's every year or the triennials every three years. And you need to attend the CSE meetings just like you do now. So um, that's pretty much it on my part. If anybody has questions later, we'll get to that. I think we went over all that, right? Oh, that, that other part, you can opt out. Okay, I missed that. You can decide that you don't want services. Homeschoolers do that. They pull the kid out of school. They don't want anything to do with the school anymore. You can choose that too. You can choose to stop all services. You'll just have at the meeting, they'll just have you sign that you're um, requesting not to receive services from the school. You can either just stop services altogether that way, or you can go private through insurance or self-pay. And um, that's an option that you have also. And the best part, yes, is that you may find that your child who previously struggled in the school setting does really well at home because they do have the ability to do the, some of the things that they need to do at home that they wouldn't be able to do in school because they would be disrupting a class. So, okay, I think that's it now. That's you now. Hi guys, <laughs> I'm Kayla. Um, we're entering our seventh year of homeschooling. My little one's gonna play some games. <laughs> um, my daughter went to kindergarten initially and um, Common Core was our catalyst for choosing homeschooling. Um, so what I found through all these years <laughs> um, is that homeschooling really does afford you the ability to create and customize your child's educa education. Um, you also have the ability to have so much flexibility with your day. Um, so in this slide here, we're going to go through what your day could potentially look like. Um, and that all depends on, you know, various factors and needs of your family. So most everyone that I speak with in the homeschool community, their, their homeschooling day is totally unique to their personal needs. Um, so if you are a working family, I know, um, you know, COVID's in, impacted so many people. So maybe if you're now remote working and homeschooling is, um, you know, your answer right now, um, you can school around your, your work schedule. So you don't have to follow the traditional methods of, an, um, not a nine to five, that's a work job, of an of a eight to two or whatever the schedule is nowadays. Um, you can school during the hours that work best for you. Um, some families even find that, you know, maybe, you know, in the homeschool community, at least, like for my family, we're not really morning people. Um, I try to be, but honestly, I'm, I'm more of a night owl. <laughs> so sometimes my kids have better focus in the afternoon. So we might, you know, schedule our day to do some work, maybe like reading, some light work in the morning, but then we'll do our core subjects um, around the lunchtime and, and um, early afternoon time. Um, with homeschooling, it usually does only take us a few hours because we are schooling. I'm personally schooling two children. My, my son is going into third and my daughter's um, so compared to a, a traditional school method, homeschooling does take a lot less hours than they would take if they were enrolled in school. Um, maybe, um, what do we have here? So style of learning, um, that also is dependent on your family needs. And there is a slide that we'll get into later for that. Um, you know, maybe you know, maybe you wake up and you're just not feeling well, or maybe your child's not feeling well. Um, you know, you could either take a day off or you could take a late day. You know, so I know um, in the homeschool community, um, every opportunity that we have to educate, we, we do try to um, take advantage of that. So if there is a sick day, I remember my son was sick one day and we turned on the Magic School Bus episode of, um, I think it was like germs and how they invade the body and then how your body fights it off. So we kind of, um, it didn't take a full school day, but we did take advantage of the ability to 
continue to educate even though he wasn't feeling well. <laughs> um, so maybe uh, you have plans for the day. So we haven't started our homeschool experience yet. We're actually starting next week. But um, tomorrow, for instance, we're having a hike with friends. So if maybe we had an event or a class, um, we could rearrange our day to meet the needs of that particular um, day. So like I said, if you have an event scheduled, you can um, schedule your schooling time around that event. So again, the flexibility factor um, is very huge. And then the last item is something unexpected. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe something happened totally unexpected that you just needed to take care of at the moment. Again, homeschooling is flexible. Uh, right here, we do have a slide of uh, an example of the Abika curriculum sample guide. There are a slew <laughs> of curriculum options. Um, we'll get into that later. And then here is a Sunlight Curriculum Teacher's Guide. It breaks down based on like your, your day times of how, how that particular curriculum might work. Um, how long is your homeschool day? So on average for right now, for my kids, my son last year in second grade, he was only a, a couple hours. And I remember my daughter who was in sixth would get kind of frustrated like, oh, why is he done already? Well, you know, he's doing second grade work and you're doing sixth grade work. So it's gonna require a little bit more effort of you. And I always tell her, um, you know, don't feel bad because he's gonna be in your seat and you're gonna be graduated. <laughs> so, um, these are just some examples. Just keep note because I know New York State does have some regulations based on how many hours we do have to complete. And I believe it is K through six is 900 hours and then seven through 12 is 990 hours. So um, I believe Teresa is gonna send an email with a link to the, home, um, the New York State Homeschool regulations. So you'll find that information in there as well. Socializing. This is awesome. This is like my favorite part because homeschoolers are so extremely social. Um, some people, I think it's funny because in the homeschool community, most people are just, I guess, they're just unaware of how many opportunities there really are for homeschoolers. Um, so I'm gonna go through, where is it? Okay, so for us personally, um, in our family, we, we've, we've done so many, so many great um, classes and so many great events prior to COVID. Um, we've been to the Cold Spring Harbor DNA Lab. We've been to the Long Island Science Center. The DNA Lab was super cool. They did um, the Anastasia DNA Lab. So it, was, it had some forensic concepts to it, which were super awesome. And then they spent two hours in the lab doing um, DNA labs. My daughter loved it. Um, the Long Island Science Center, um, gosh, what did they do? That's in Riverhead. They had done a, there was like this really cool sand table and it like mapped out the depths and everything. But I believe they did um, a different class with bones there. The Brookhaven National Lab, we've done a bunch of classes there. The Adventure Park we've been to, we love getting up in those trees. Um, we did a Harry Potter museum tour in Manhattan. We do field day, which is so fun. Um, but because we love it so much, we do it in the spring and fall. So again, that brings back to that idea of flexibility within homeschooling. You can totally customize um, not only the education aspects, but the fun aspects too, which is super fun. We do a back to end of no school picnic and book swap. That we do spring and fall too, because we just like to get together and have fun. Um, we've been to Halloween parties. We've been to trick or treating at the Wall Women Mall. And that's just like a very small portion of what we've done. I know Teresa has also been um, creating a whole, she creates so many classes and she was just showing a bunch through um, the yearbook that she put together. There was a semi-formal dance, an LTV studio workshop, the Guild Hall Student Art Festival, a tour at Ohika Castle, multicultural fairs, the historical costume ball, science fairs, so we do those too, <laughs> baking contests, annual family talent nights, a firearms and safety class, which I keep telling her I want to do again, and the SUNY Science Labs. Um, through COVID, you know, it's a very interesting time, not only for people in the current education model, but also for homeschoolers, because, you know, a lot of the places that we have been utilizing for our events and classes are just not open at this moment. Um, but we're still able to get together for hikes and park hangouts and the places that are still offering, you know, class opportunities. 
So, you know, we are having some tough times too, but we're, you know, trying to adapt as best we can. Um, the homeschooling styles, there are a whole bunch of homeschooling styles. And I, I remember when I first started investigating homeschooling, um, a veteran homeschool mom had told me to pick up a book called 102 Top Picks for Homeschool Curriculum by Kathy Duffy. Um, in it, she goes over, well, she offers a quiz that allows the um, parent or the person who'll be educating the homeschool child the ability to figure out what their teaching style is. And then there's a quiz for you to determine what the child's learning style is, because we all learn differently. Maybe we're visual, maybe we're auditory, maybe we're kinesthetic, um, maybe we're a combination of, you know, one or the other. Um, but it gives you the ability to figure out how you would best homeschool. And then within that book, she also gives some great reviews on curriculum that might meet that teaching style. Um, there are also other teaching styles in the sense of um, right here where it says school at home. So school at home is basically, it's a structured packaged curriculum. Some curriculums are offered in an all in one kind of bundle um, where you would just buy the curriculum from one curriculum company and every single course subject is included in that curriculum. There's also other curriculums that are like standalone subjects. So you could go to one company for your math, another company for your science, um, another curriculum option for your history and so on and so forth. There's also your library. Um, your library is probably your biggest tool uh, with its you know, just vast um, array and option of books. We love our library. Um, we also love, I know Teresa was talking about it earlier, the Middle Country Library has um, the educational resource card for homeschoolers. So we're able to utilize their databases, which was such a, such a gift. Um, but let me get back to here. Sorry, I went on a tangent. So unschooling is another homeschool style and that's child-led interest-based learning. So if your child is interested in a particular um, topic or just has, you know, interest number, I remember I saw a TED talk that was done by like an 11 year old boy in California. Um, he's homeschooled and he called it hack schooling. It was such a great video because his homeschooling experience was totally around his love of um, snowboarding and his parents basically just customized his homeschool experience where he would learn math around snowboarding. Um, he would learn science and you know the history of it. They also got him involved in, he was not working, but he was work, um, he had the ability to like apprentice at a snowboarding shop where he was actually able to create his own snowboards and his gear. Um, so that's maybe an example of what un unschooling could look like. Classical is structured full days. Charlotte Mason is a nature-based approach. So again, it's structured days in the morning and then in your afternoons, you're out in nature, maybe going on a hike, um, out at a lake, going to the beach. We have so many options living on Long Island um, that there's so many great opportunities for a Charlotte Mason approach. Montessori uh, is a kinesthetic learning style where you use a lot of unscheduled time. So that allows the child to develop and learn how to manage their time relaxed and eclectic. So the mornings are more for formal structured work where you would sit down and do your, your core subjects and then your afternoons are used for hobbies and special projects. Um, again, there's no set times, but the child's expected to meet educational goals. Waldorf is um, rhythm and consistency are really important. So the daily schedule is designed to flow easily. And then multiple intelligences. And here the goal is to adapt scheduling a material so that it could bring out the child's natural strengths. So again, um, in that book, Kathy Duffy will go over these, but if you want to just Google them, there's so much information out there available. Okay, so here is some examples of matching a, a homeschool style to a curriculum. So here you have traditional, which is like the school at home option, and it lists some of those curriculum options. So you have Abika, Alpha Omega, Bob Jones University, Calvert, Christian Light. Then below that you'll see some Charlotte Mason and it lists Ambleside. I hope I'm reading this okay. 
um, Queen Homeschool Supplies, Five in a Row, Sunlight, and Winter Promise. And then again, it says distance learning options, unit study options, and then classical education options. And Kathy Duffy has all of um, these curriculum options on her site, which makes it so super easy to figure out um, if it might be a good option for you. There's also other um, websites where you could get your curriculum from. So in the past, I've used christianbook.com. There's also rainbowresources.com. Um, and what's great about those two sites is they allow you to kind of see a couple pages of the curriculum. So you could, that could help um, you decipher if it might be a good fit or not. Um, there's also Amazon.com. If you're looking for maybe a more cost effective method, obviously your library. But in addition to that, I know that there's a whole bunch of um, Facebook groups that offer um, or where they'll sell or trade or what it, it's like a buy, sell, swap group on Facebook that will allow you to get um, secondhand gently used curriculum. So that could save some money there as well. Okay, lastly, testing. So there is no testing required before grade four. Um, in grade three, there are some um, evaluation methods. You can choose to test in grades one through three, but you do not have to. You can use an alternative education, um, not education, alternative evaluation method, which would be a written narrative. Um, the written narrative um, in the regulations, in the New York State regulations, the 100.1 or 100.10, um, it will detail who is allowed to write the written narrative. There is a section that says, or other person, you are the other person. <laughs> so you'll just notify um, your district in your third quarterly report if you will be writing a written narrative. Um, most of the time, I mean, at least in my experience, I usually don't hear back from my district and um, we always say no news is good news. So if they don't get back to you, then you just continue and proceed based on what you had notified them. Um, okay. Here is on the left is an example of a written narrative. And then sample two that is right to the right of it is the example of a quarterly report. To the right though, you'll see that there is something that says narrative evaluation. Um, so you could either put a grade or um, just a blurb where it's, you know, um, improving um, along those lines. Okay, so grades four through eight, your options are testing. Um, on those New York State regulations, there are there is a list that tells you which tests are um, approved based on New York State. Or what's interesting with grades four through eight, um, you can test grades four, six, and eight. And then in between on grades five and seven, you can opt to do the written narrative. Most families opt to do the testing on grades five and seven. That way they're, they're um, tested less. And then you could write your written narrative on grades four, six, and eight. And then here it says the written narrative could be prepared by a New York State certified teacher, a home instruction peer group review panel, or other person. Again, that other person um, could be you. And then it says this Again, okay, so that just re, um, states what I said earlier. This alternative evaluation form can be used no more or no more often than every other school year. So it says it again, four, six, eight, or five, seven. Grades nine to 12, testing is every year. So here's a list, um, like I said, these are the, the list of the tests that are stated in the New York State Homeschool Regulations. Most people, um, can get the testing from www.seatontesting.com. Oh, and that's it. It's so great to see all you guys. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so now we're going to take questions if uh, they gave questions. I think they were sending them to K 
Kayla, right? Did they send you any? The Children's Services did send me two questions. Um, one of the questions, Teresa, I think I sent to you, so I, would, I don't know if Sophia would want you to respond privately or um, if she's okay answering her question amongst the rest of the panel here. Um, did you get that chat that I sent to you? Not me. No? I can't see the screen. <laughs> Oh. That's why I was getting sent to the younger ladies. Oh, I see. Let me check with Sophia, make sure it's okay that we broadcast her question. And go to the other one and I'll answer while you're asking. Yeah, her. that's a great. Okay, so the other question was um, while the other one is um, working alone, uh, you know, doing something else alone. I don't know. I mean, everybody's situation is going to be different. That's just something that I would do and just do like small. Um, amounts of work at a time just get through whatever you can get through but if children are like distracting each other like I had that case with my son the noise canceling headphones really helped um, so that's other something else you could do for that they can probably work on a project together as well just change your day a little bit and instead of doing math right now do science and do a, an experiment together to you know, bring the level down a little bit. Yeah, take a physical activity break to, you know, go for a my, walk. Or... My daughter used to have to sit and do a um, her math work because that was her least favorite. And then she'd get up and go over to the, the TV and do a dance with the Wiggles. And yeah. then she'd come <laughs> back to the, the desk and, and do her next subject. And then she'd go back to the, the TV and do another dance. She had to get energy out. So it was back and forth. Uh, you can do that as well. It's just the way our day was structured. Yeah, my son was extremely distractible. I used to say that he would hear leaves falling down the street. So <laughs> when no kids were home, he could just be distracted by a dust floating by. But a lot of it is redirection. You have some kids at home, they're making noise. A lot of it is just redirection and, you know, breaking it up and just trying, just getting it done any way you can, really. We have another question. Um, it's actually two individuals actually ask the same question. So they wanted to know if they start remote schooling and then want to pull out from the district after they've started remote schooling, can they pull out and begin homeschooling? Yes. Uh, normally without COVID, you can pull out any time of the year. Uh, you submit your letter of intent saying that you intend to homeschool. You can keep them home from school that day. Uh, and you don't have to send them back again. But if you decide homeschooling is not working for you, you should be able to re-enroll them and get them back into the school system. Uh, with COVID, each school district has their own thing right now. Some are saying that you can't enroll mid-year. You have to homeschool for the entire year. So you have to find out what your district's plan of opening is, what their uh, school plan is. If they, if they have room for your student, if you um, pull out, do homeschooling, and it doesn't work for you. Um, but we have a great support group. We're going to really try to help you make it work, um, give you what you need, a little encouragement, direction, whatever is needed, uh, short of being there in the room <laughs> with you. What the districts have to do is they have to take your child back, but they don't have to put them back in the school that they came out of. Right. So if you had them in this elementary school, you pull them out and now you want to re-enroll them, they have to provide you a spot in the district. And what they're saying is that they may not be able to put your child in that, back in that school based on how many spaces they have. So that's another consideration. If they do accept them, it might not be the closest school to your house or the school that, you know, their other friends go to or something. That they used to. Okay. Is there any other questions? Yeah, there's actually two questions. One is, um, so this person's daughter receives a teacher, a teacher of the deaf services through her 504. Is she still entitled to these services now that they will be homeschooling? That would be there. It, it's going to be tricky. I would. Uh, it's going to depend on why. It, it, the services for like when the child, when the teacher's teaching, and somebody's sitting next to the child, and 
giving them that instruction closer, you might not get that at home because now you're the child's teacher and you could sit right next to the child and provide that. 504 is a little bit different than an IEP. So it's gonna really depend on exactly what is in that 504 and what the accommodations are. And if there are accommodations that you can make in your home, most likely that's not gonna be something that the school's gonna provide. Okay, um, here's another question. So how can we get connected to the support group that you were mentioning, Teresa? Um, they're a little concerned about the socialization aspect. Yeah, we, we have a lot of people concerned about socializing. That's why I included our yearbook in here. This is normally what we do, but um, the discussion on group was today was socializing, basically. Yeah. Homeschooling is very social. We're barely home. The, the first page of my, uh, my album says, I don't know why they call it homeschooling. We're never home. This is the yearbook um, that, with all the pictures in it. Um, there's a lot of socializing. COVID is not social. COVID is separating and um, social distancing and staying to yourself and uh, staying in small groups. But normally homeschooling is a lot of people. Uh, we have a lot of friends. My daughter's birthday parties are a really good example. We can't fit all of her friends in our house, so we have to rent a space to have her birthday parties because there's usually about 60 people showing up at her parties. So you can be as social as you want to be. It's You're not going to be dropping them off at a building with 100 kids in it or 1,000 kids in it. You're going to be the one driving to the event. You're going to be the one making friends with the moms or the dads that are there as well. And they're going to be socializing with kids that are not their own age most of the time. My daughter is now 20, but she's got a girl who calls her her best friend who's 11. Um, because, you know, we don't have those boundaries with 10 year olds teaching other 10 year olds how to act. Um, we may have it here and there, but we may have a two year old teaching the 10 year old how to act. <laughs> So you can be as social as you want to be. And the group is on Facebook. It's called Homeschool on Long Island. I screen people to come in the group. You have to give me your cell phone number. I give you mine as well. I want to know what town you live in and your the kids' ages. I don't need to know their names. I'll know them soon enough when we see you at an event. So you will be screened to be in the group. And in the long email that I send out, I have groups that may be in your area. It's, if you're in the city, I have groups on there that are in the city or Queens or Long Island groups. So I've got a, uh, I try to cover uh, different areas and what kind of group would you want to be in? We have uh, the Loving Muslim Mothers uh, group. We have uh, Homeschooling Special Needs Children group. We've got um, just Long Island homeschoolers. We've got just the East End. It, it depends on where you want to be. And you don't have to only socialize with people that are in your town. I'm sure not everybody here has married their husband or their wife um, next door, you know, in their own town. I, I met mine halfway across the island, although he did happen to be going to church next door. So most of us, our best friend didn't live next door. Uh, as we get older, the ones that last, you know, they could have been living in the city at a time. So just try to expand your horizons on what town you want to socialize in. So you can be as social as you want to be. Sorry. Yeah, I agree to that point as well. Um, and I also found, I remember when I first started homeschooling, um, if, you, if you find out that maybe there's not a, a class or an event, um, your child is maybe not, maybe they're just not interested in what's being offered through the homeschool event, you as the parent now have the ability to customize your child's ed education experience. So, you know, you can create, you can create your own events. So you can create park play days in your, in your um, location. They say, um, if you build it, they will come, right? So if you create the event, people in your area um, through the homeschooling community will see your event and, and want to join. Maybe, you know. Um, For a long time, I couldn't get anyone to post on the calendar of events. So I started doing it. I wanted to be able to help people and bless people. So I started setting up these crazy events, you know, 
um, uh, skydiving. We did, um, I set up for skydiving where the kids would go through trying on all the gear and learning about skydiving and jump out of a parked airplane, which was really, really a cute idea. And the one story I love the best is this young man showed up at, uh, we did a class at Dowling College who had flight simulators. So we got the tour of Dowling College that's not there anymore, but they got to go on the flight simulator and this young man just loved the flight simulator. And then he showed up at the Air National Guard when I set up for that class. And he is today, he's a, a pilot. He got so inspired in those classes that he joined um, and went to school to become a full 747 type pilot. And he's my, he's my story. I got him started in flying. <laughs> so there's a lot of things to do, but I'm really trying my best to get them on the calendar because with COVID, Everybody I've emailed said, no, we're closed till spring. Sorry, we're closed down. So right now I'm in the process of replicating some of those classes that we always did over the years. Uh, we did one called Shipwreck Island where you would go on, on this point of sand that we have out here. It looks like an island, it's a peninsula, and learn how to live off the, the beach if you were shipwrecked. So it's a really great program, but they're not doing anything till spring, maybe. So I've got some people working on it. We're going to try to give that class with social distancing to be able to, to give this class because there's absolutely no reason to be able to, to not be able to meet outside and distance um, safely. So we're going to try to do that. So I'm, I'm working on that. Is there any other questions? <clears throat> What tips do you have? Hmm. What tips do you, oh. Okay, so what tips do you have if they're not maybe a, a great crafter? So easy ideas. Um, this person's worried about science and ELA. There's a, a lot of curriculum. Some are what we call a box curriculum where you get everything you need for the school year in that box and there are science kits in there. You can buy the science kits by yourself. There's YouTube videos um, that have science people on there that do um, uh, experiments. Uh, the kits that I was talking about just before, they, they contain every chemical you need or every piece of equipment that you're going to need to do all of those um, the, the science things during the year, all the experiments. So for each grade, Sunlight Curriculum or Apologia has these great kits that you can buy for say science, language arts, Wordly Wise 3000, I really loved um, because it was free. I know you can buy the workbook, but I've discovered Wordly Wise 3000 online and it's got, um, a teacher's area and a student area. If you go to the student area, you can go to the resources section and download the MP3 files of a word list and get learn the definition of that word. It reads it back to you and it gives you a chance to answer. Say the word watching, watching, watching means you're standing there, blah, blah, blah. And then it'll give you samples of what it's like of what the word means. And then you're supposed to pick between the two samples. Is it this or is it this? So it's got that all the way up to 12th grade. And that's the one that we chose to use. You don't have to use it, but I liked it because it was free. <laughs> and you can print out the uh, workbook. Another way to do it is with, uh, say, Tom Sawyer. And if you're reading a book, a history kind of, uh, a book on American history, and there's a word in there that you don't know, you have the kid write down that word that you know they don't know. So you're gonna pick words out of the reading list to look up in the dictionary and write out the explanation of what that means, the definition of what that word means. That's another way that sometimes unschoolers would do it. Are there any dads homeschooling? Oh yeah. Yeah. My husband never wanted to do it again when I got sick, but uh, he said, don't you ever do that to me again. I was down for the week and he had to take care of her. 
and she was young at the point and yeah but there's a lot of dads that will show up at the uh the classes anybody else want to chime in please do <laughs> and a few dads at our um a chess cl club that we did that was what kayla was talking about too like my son had very narrow interests and anything he liked that wasn't a video game i just created homeschool get togethers and we so we start he had an interest in chess and there was a um a homeschool graduate who actually became a professional chess teacher and we had this chess club running for seven or eight years now that i was able to organize and put together and we have really nice size groups of kids that came and uh, this year we're doing it over Zoom because we can't meet like we used to do. But if you have, a kid has an interest, you can organize something. Yeah, choir, and their interest. chorus, uh, band practice, yeah. uh, all kinds of things. Uh, we have homeschool choir, homeschool band, uh, music lessons. Um, I have one lady who's going to teach workout for, for the kids. She's a bodybuilder. She's going to be teaching workout classes for the kids. Uh, another is sports. Uh, he teaches in-person sports, um, but he's up in Nassau and Queens. And we do have homeschool gym class out here, not out by me, but in the middle of the island, there's a, uh, a homeschool gym class. So you can set something up at like flip-flops, gymnastics or parkour. Uh, a lot of people would sign up for these things. And some of the places, uh, uh, Adventure Park, those, those places where you're climbing the treetops or climbing the, the rock walls. We, we do that, the trampoline places. There's a lot of uh, physical activity kind of classes that we do. Yeah, just to chime in too, um, in our household, my husband um, has been working remotely through COVID. So we usually um, refer to him as the principal, but there have been many times that he's <laughs> in and homeschooled our children as well. Um, I feel like, you know, homeschooling is kind of like a lifestyle and it becomes a family dynamic. So a lot of dads are definitely involved. Um, you know, if, if you're home and, and you're gonna be the educator, there are definitely other dads. I remember going to um, the Adventure Park for um, a homeschool event and, you know, the dad was there that day. And, um, you know, so there are many dads that do end up at park play dates and, and um, adventure park events and, and they do partake in the schooling because you know um, I just feel like as part of a family dynamic dads have responsibilities right so um, they have at least in my home my my husband has a responsibility to our homeschooling efforts as well um, things that maybe he, he has strengths in and he can help out actually a, a great example English and language arts are not my topic you can give me math and science and I'm like the queen but when it comes to English language arts and like writing, I, like I feel like my daughter at 12, she's a better writer than me. So my husband, that's his strength. So when he needs, to, when she does a paper or writes an essay, well, guess what? Who reviews it? He does. Because I feel he would be a better, um, I don't know, I guess just like a better teacher in that aspect to, to, to help her grow and, um, just do better in that area where, where I don't have that strength. So yes, there are definitely dads and, and we welcome them. So it's just not, you know, it's just not as moms always. It's, it's just. Yeah. And I homeschooled cross country. We took a cross country trip and my husband um, took, took off work and we went cross country and we used an app called uh, Roadside America. And we found all these little holes in the wall, kind of crazy places. And we were tourists for the month. We took a month to go cross country. I think it was six weeks uh, cross country, learning history as we went along. Found where Jesse James was and um, a lot of really cool places. Yeah. Okay, here's another question. This is kind of like a, a multi-part question. Um, so the first part, they're looking for more free resources. Um, I know for me personally, I know easy peasy is a free resource, like an all-in-one type curriculum. Khan Academy is another great option. Um, am I missing any others, Teresa, Dara? I um, find some on the Homeschool Buyers Co-op also. Go ahead, sorry, Dara. One that I recommend, it's not free, but it's $24 or $25 for a year access. It's called Super Teacher Worksheets. You can probably teach in your 
pre-K through fifth grader just from that website. And you have, you can print out everything on there. So, I mean, it's not free, but it's very low cost. And I even use it for my kids when they were in school. I would print out stuff for them. So it's a good resource to have. Did you say super teacher worksheets? Is that what you super said? Super teacher worksheets. They do have limited access for free, but to get the entire website's access, you pay $25 for a year. And then the second part is, um, what is the physical? So on. Going back to that. What was the other one you said? Did you say access, Dara? Access and super teacher work? Super teacher works, um, super teacher worksheets. That was the only one I said. Oh, okay. And then Teresa, you said one too, right? Homeschool buyers co-op. Okay. And then the ones that I said were Khan Academy and, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot what I said. I know there's Facebook groups too, that's free schooling. Homeschooling mm -hmm. with the movies, if you've got movies. Netflix. Netflix, homeschooling Netflix. with Netflix, which that's what seven something a month or so. Um, if you've already got net, Netflix, there you go. You're already paying for it. You can homeschool mm -hmm. with Netflix. There's a Facebook group for that. Mm -hmm. There's books called homeschooling with the movies, movies you may already have. And then, so um, that second question is, what is the physical education, art and music? For third grade requirement for homeschool, is there a specific amount of hours per year for those those areas? Not per subject. There's no specific amount of time. There's just the 900 hours or the 990 hours for seventh grade and up. You just you don't have to break that down on your worksheets either. There's no worksheets. It's the I have the letter of intent and the quarterly reports, and you don't need to give on the quarterly report. You don't need to give each subject broken down by minutes or hours. It's just total number of hours for that particular quarter. And how do you track the 900 hours? I know, Teresa, you're going to include. Um, yeah, this, uh, this is how I track it with my uh, cardboard calendar. It's uh, just a calendar from Maine. It's hard. It stands up. It's got a lot of space for writing. Um, I have a, a spreadsheet that I created. Um, for Mac or Windows computer, that's usually, that's attached to the long email is the spreadsheet. Um, I used to go through the beginning of the year. Uh, it's color coded by quarter and it adds it up at the bottom, how many hours you got. And at the very end, it tells you how many hours total that you got. I went through that spreadsheet at the very beginning of the year and filled it all out. And then if there were sick days and we didn't actually do anything or even watch a, a, a health video or a, a science video or whatever, I would change the hours on that. And it would give me a, a number at the bottom. And that's what you put on the quarterly report. The attendance sheet, you, I call that spreadsheet the attendance sheet. You don't, you are required to give it, to take attendance, you are required to keep attendance by New York State regulations, but you're not required to give it to the school every quarter. The school can ask you for attendance, and then what you would do is take that sheet, make a photocopy of that particular quarter that you're in when they ask you for it, and send that with your, net, your quarterly report to show that that's the hours. And then you don't send it again. You are not required to send it in automatically. The school can't ask you to send it automatically. That's not in the regulations. They have to ask you every single time they want it. Don't agree to just send it in automatically. Makes it harder for everybody else because they did it, why won't you? So we wanna keep the regulations the way they are. Don't send it unless they ask for it. There. <laughs> no more? I don't see any more. Nope. Anyone else have any other questions? Well, if you have any more questions, you can email me at that address or um, apply to join the group and one of us will answer your questions or somebody else. We have a lot of veteran homeschoolers in the group as well. We do have a lot of new people. So try to make sure that it's a veteran homeschooler answering your questions. You probably will see the difference in the answers uh, that you get. 
but there's a lot of people there to help. And with that, I think that's it. I think we're done for the night, unless there's another